There was a Wharton professor who said that Code Interpreter could complete in seconds things that took me weeks to master in my PhD. So it's really like having an impressive data scientist. OpenAI themselves say, this is kind of like having a very eager junior programmer who wants to do everything for you at your fingertips. On today's show, we're talking about OpenAI's Code Interpreter, how you can use it to be your data analyst, to be your software engineer, and more importantly, hack your marketing for better business growth. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner, CMO at HubSpot. I'm joined by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the CMO over at Zapier. And this is Marketing Against the Grain, your show for marketing-minded people. Let's get into today's episode. Kieran, Kieran, you and I have been begging for Code Interpreter access for a while. It's, it, it was something that OpenAI teased. And finally, if you're a, a paying OpenAI chat, paying chat GPT customer, you have Code Interpreter access. Tell the people, first of all, what's it feel like to have it and what the heck is Code Interpreter? Well, it feels great. The two things I use most in life right now are annoyingly Google Bard. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, so resentful for having for liking Bard. It makes you so sad. Well, what's happened actually is at the same time I got access to Google Bard, I I sent you this report yesterday where, and we might do an entire episode on this, GPT-4 is becoming yes. less accurate over time. Ever since launch, it's actually degraded in quality. And so there's a lot of theories in that that they're trying to save costs, that they're trying to like figure out how to get you into these micro models that are maybe not as accurate. But basically Google Bard comes out I start to use it. It's really good. One of the cool things it's really good for is, you know how bad I am at like pronouncing names. And I- <laughs> This is true. You're and, so bad. And I hate, I hate like coming on and going, oh, like, how do you say your name? Hello, it's like a respectful thing to do. You can actually go to Google Bard and ask it to pronounce a name because it does audio. And so this morning I had a meeting That's with awesome. someone, a founder, and I was like, hey, how do you pronounce this name? Got the name right first time. And so really good for those kind of things but I'm still using OpenAI for code interpreters. So like, what is code interpreter? I think there's a couple of good quotes. We did an initial episode when it first came out and now everyone is getting access and starting to see like the power of this thing. There was a Wharton professor who said that code interpreter can complete in seconds things that took me weeks to master in my PhD. So it's really like having an impressive data scientist. OpenAI themselves say, this is kind of like having a very eager junior programmer at the, you know, at, at your fingertips. So being able to have a junior programmer who wants to do everything for you at your fingertips. And so pretty powerful. Like I, w I wake up today, I have plus access, I have code interpreter access, and now I have like this data scientist slash like junior programmer. Pretty amazing to live in a world where we get these kind of superpowers overnight. Right, yeah. So I've got the article from the Wharton professor, Ethan, Ethan Mollick on, which I think we're gonna have Ethan on the show soon, hopefully. So fingers crossed, Ethan, if you're watching, come on the show. We'd love to have you, wanna talk all about this. But yeah, here's the money quote. Things that took me weeks to master my PhD were completed in seconds by the AI. And there were generally fewer errors than I would expect from a human analyst. I think that is the underrated sneaky part of this, is not only was it fast, but the errors were fewer than he would have expected if he had had another person do it. Right. And so it's basically like having a faster, more accurate analyst at your fingertips versus... Right another person that you're going to have to work with, coordinate with everything there, right? Yeah. And one of the things that I realized actually over the weekend, this is true of everything in relation to how I think about AI, which is I was using Code Interpreter a bunch over the weekend. We're going to get into like some of the use cases that we used it just to show the power of Code Interpreter to all of our listeners. But really what it does is it takes away the burden of having to do the work. And so then, then you're left with like, okay, well, what should I do, right? Like, what question, what intelligent questions can I ask it? Why those questions are actionable? And so like what AI has given us is the ability to like automate a bunch of things, right? Like we are now able to say, hey, like we can go do all this work. And now the real, the real skill is learning how to use that power, like how to ask it to go do things that are actually meaningful, that are actionable, that are actually valuable. Whenever I see someone do an analysis, I always ask them, okay, like, if you do this analysis, are you going to have clear recommendations and are those recommendations going to lead to actions? Very similar, like now I have an AI, which is now I have AI, can I like figure out like what to do 
and how to ask it the right questions to do that stuff. And I think it's a skill that still many of us are still learning how to do. I love that. And doubling down on use cases, I wanted to show you a tweet from Matt Wolf, friend of the show. I think we're interviewing Matt for the show like in a week or so. So super excited to have Matt. He has a great YouTube channel. If you haven't seen his YouTube channel, go check that out. Hit subscribe. While you're on YouTube, hit subscribe to our channel, please. Drop us a comment on what use case you are most interested in using Code Interpreter for or have used Code, code Interpreter for already. So Kieran, I thought Matt outlined some really great and really practical things that anyone can go and do with Code Interpreter right now. We're gonna talk about number two, cause we did a little of this CSV of your YouTube data. Wait, wait, wait for it. We got some cool uh, use cases we wanna show you in a minute, but like convert a video file into an animated GIF, generate a QR code from a URL, analyze HTML, J uh, CSS or JS code to find improvements or vulnerabilities. Like those are really, really cool use cases that you need to use in day-to-day -day work that just got 10 times easier and 10 times faster. Right, right. I, and, I, and by the way, the cost for all this is $20 a month. Right, yeah, like this is the- this Like is the, it's kind of laughable, right? It can also do like incredible things. I don't know if you saw the, the example of it creating a shot of a still image and panning like of the, of the food. Oh, I didn't Pan, see that. Panning left to right, I can show you that. It's um, pretty, pretty cool. All right, this is an example of, you know, this person give it a still shot of this graphic and it was able to start to like pan left and right and create that image. Now, I don't know what this image would be ever used for, but just a good example of how it's not, it's like creating code to do these things, right? Yeah. It's actually creating code in the background to able to like edit video, someone else created a, a color scheme and be able to extract colors from a web page to create a palette and be able to use that palette for their own brand and purposes and their own style guide. So just tons of different use cases. Actually, I think it's like, to me, the most powerful update for GPT and OpenAI since they launched the initial ChatGPT. For me, it's the one I've used the most. All right, we just talked about some of the use cases, how you could use Code Interpreter, what Code Interpreter actually is. Kieran, we did a little Code Interpreter magic that we wanna share with everybody to get deep practical. We use Code Interpreter to help us with the show. Right. And one of the unique things about our show is that it is an audio podcast and a YouTube show simultaneously. We record it on video for YouTube, but we also publish the audio on RSS. And we wanted to see some things. We wanted to see, oh, what content and shows do well on YouTube versus RSS? What are our best performing shows? A lot of the things the average business creator, marketer is going to want to know. The thing we really wanted to understand was we are here trying to create a YouTube slash like modern day podcast really are, should be YouTube first. And you still have to really care about the RSS feed. Like most of our listeners are still coming through the RSS, but we really want to start to grow YouTube over time. Now that's going to be really hard to do if when we create an episode for our podcast, it does well on one platform and not well on the other because it kind of means we're stuck trying to create like one for the RSS audience, one for the YouTube audience. And so we're trying to find what are like topics that resonate between two. So what did we do? This is the cool thing about Code Interpreter. First of all, we started with two files. We started This with is crazy, by the way, yeah. two different files because we're talking about two different platforms. Yeah, and I will bring up, basically this conversation took me two hours. I was watching the Wimbledon final and doing Code Interpreter. <laughs> what a great final. Novak is- Proper Irish of you to be yeah. watching the Wimbledon final and doing Code Interpreter work. Okay, so we started, we started with a data ac extract from RSS. So we had one file for RSS and then we, then we had an extract for YouTube and we had one file for YouTube. Now, the first thing you can do is actually just ask Code Interpreter, can you tell me what are what data is in these files? And it will give you like a really cool rundown of actually the data in the file. So I'll show you that that's, what, <laughs> look how long this is. I'll show you like, that's where I kind of started, which is like, hey, like here's what's in this file, right? That's pretty cool. Yep. Cause then I can start to figure out how I can like actually manipulate that data. But the thing I wanted to do is basically get Code Interpreter to sort each file in terms of most popular RSS shows and then label them from position like one all the way down to whatever the last position was sorted by views for RSS. So like for RSS, I sorted the entire list from one to the bottom based upon stack ranked on, on downloads. Did the exact same for YouTube, right? Created a list from one to the bottom stack ranked on YouTube views. And then start to like blend those two tables together so we can start to see like what 
performs well across those two platforms. Let me come all the way down to like when I actually got it to do this stuff. I will also say that if you are listening on RSS right now, we are walking through the whole visuals on YouTube. So check out the Marketing Against the Grain YouTube channel if you want to see the whole visual walkthrough of how we did all this in Code Interpreter. Right. So like here, so basically created the RSS table sorted by downloads, create the YouTube table sorted by views, and then ask Code Interpreter based upon the date that was published to join those two things together and create a simplistic table. So you can see here, I've created tables that are sorted from RSS position, but actually adds the YouTube position of that episode, right? So like you can see that the first most popular RSS episode that we have this year is like only number 79 on YouTube. And this is actually only for 2023 episodes, right? Number two is 85, number three is 42. So you can see what's happening here is like the ones that perform well in RSS are not performing as well on YouTube. And we went down to like this table here. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like show me the episodes that performed within five positions of each other. Pretty cool, right? Like yeah, any episodes cool. where they where they were like similar in RSS performance, similar in YouTube performance in terms of that stock rank. And there was only like three episodes and I thought it was pretty interesting. Like two of them were, you know, marketing use cases. One of them was the episode we did around Elon. And then you can ask it just to create some like interesting visuals. And this was like a super interesting visual, which is like, show, oh, me, is awesome. show me the correlation between episodes that performed well on, on YouTube and performed well in RSS. Again, sorted by the position, the position of those episodes within that stack rank, right? So it's basically what it's showing you is the RSS on the right, YouTube position on the left, and there's just no correlation between those two things, right? And it, so it actually highlights a real problem for us that we need to solve, which is Correct. we have to try to figure out what topics are in the middle of the RSS and the YouTube Venn diagram and what Code Interpreter helped us to do with two separate files, data extract that I didn't even have to tell it what was in that file for the RSS downloads, data extract on YouTube that I didn't even have to tell it what was in that file. The other thing, keep in mind, it created these two tables and stored them and allowed me to like go back and say, hey, can you now join those two tables together on date to create this new table where you sort by RSS and then add the YouTube position. And I have another one where I can add the views and I can add the downloads so the table can be more expansive. I took them out for the sake of this episode because we didn't wanna go through all of the individual performance of each and every episode. But, and then you could just say, hey, like based upon that third table you created, create some visualizations to show me if there's any correlation. And it actually comes out and says, there's no correlation between videos that perform well in RSS <laughs> and videos that perform well on YouTube. I created a scatter plot chart as well. Now, let's go back to a world, like the kind of, you know, the old world of like 2022, when everything was like, all, <laughs> the old world of, all, of, of less than a year was ago. All such a nice and tranquil world. And, but you did not have this. So what would I've had to do? I would have had to like put these things in Google Sheets. I would have had to do a, a pivot chart. I would have had to like sort them. I would have had to like do my own data visualizations. I just can't like emphasize as much like how powerful these tools are to get it work done much, much faster and to get an insights much, much faster. And not just that, like you can actually ask it itself, like, is there any correlation? And we'll not just do the visual. It will tell you like there's weak correlation. There's a lot of correlation. And it does give you guidelines. So I could say like, what commonalities did the three videos have that performed well across RSS and YouTube? And it will actually tell me commonalities. Now I will say at the moment, the advice it gives for those kind of things, pretty vanilla, like pretty standard. Well, what, what's also great about ChatGPT right now, I, I agree with Kieran that I think Bard is... I like the engagement and some of the features of Bard better and some of the parts of the Bard model better. But what happened is producer Darren gave us these raw files out of software. Kieran took those raw files that just had no context and made all these tables, all these graphs that he was just talking you about. And then you did something pretty fucking mind blowing, right? You just shared that entire data, that entire interaction with me. Right. Because because in chat GPT, you can share a chat, which is pretty freaking crazy, right? Like you're like, wait a second, I, I can share a chat? Yes, you can share a chat. And so he, so Kieran's watching Wimpleton. He, he does all this. We're kind of going back and forth on Slack and WhatsApp and everything. We're like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. 
And then I'm like, oh, I want I want to do some stuff. Can you send me some of that data? And he sends me that data. Can you actually start? Oh, shit. Wait a minute. You can actually, when I send you a chat, you can start to, <laughs> wait a minute, really? <laughs> yes, I just built off of all of this. Oh, fuck me. I did not know you could do that. I thought I just shared the chat with you as like a, holy shit. So you can just build on top of what I sent you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That is actually on the fucking leaveable. I did not. Why didn't I realize that's incredible. that? Incredible. That's so dumb. I don't know. So shit, you can just like start sending people and they can just build on the work that you've did that rapidly. Oh, we're in a new world, people. This is the new, <laughs> this is the new world. Let's fucking go. I love that I'm blowing your mind with this. <laughs> that's cool, man. So. So Kieran sends me this link and I just start building on it. And Kieran, you had all this data. And so what did I obviously do? I said, oh, based on this, these charts that are from, that Kieran did, what are some guests we should have on our show? Oh. What are the topics that you would recommend that have overlap between these? Can you give me some recommended episodes? And I was like, can you give me 10 show ideas for to maximize our audience on both YouTube and RSS? So what's magical about it is, is three things. First, you're able to do all this analysis so fast and all in one place. The second thing is you can share it and it can be multiplayer. I love and the that. The third thing is you can take the analysis and go from analysis to action where we have like a whole set now of, of ideas that like some of which we'll do, some of which we won't, but like it's pretty incredible what it's able to do in terms of taking that data and going and recalling that data. Like I asked it, for example, hey, based on our performance on YouTube, what are some additional shows we could do to grow our audience on YouTube? And it took all that data and gave me those recommendations. That just simply wasn't possible a year ago. Like it, it just wasn't. Like literally you could take all the manual work you wanted in the world and it just wasn't physically possible. Yeah, you can rapidly, like you couldn't rapidly just build on top of someone's work that that fast? No, and that's the, that's the thing. It's like, you could screw around with this while you're watching the Wimbledon final on, on a Sunday and then kick it over to me. And like, we had had basically an entire marketing plan for our show in one shared thread. Especially with data, like the incredible thing with data is we wanted to, we could just send that link out with one of our episodes and we could ask like our listeners to like build on that figure out some like interesting insights, share them with us, add them to the comments. You can basically like rapidly go from data to insights through the knowledge of other people and actually learn through your team. Like it's, a, I love the multiplayer analogy. Like chat, I think has grown rapidly to hundred million users, but it really did that through being a single player app, right? Like it's not like threads that kind of grew because it's a social platform and you build that with your friends and tag your friends and your friends come in and join. Like it predominantly was a single player experience where you're chatting with that AI. And I know they added to share and I was playing around with the share, but I always thought that the share just actually just showed you exactly, like more like showed you exactly what I did. I didn't know you could then just like come in and start to like build on top of like it's building blocks. That's a really great team feature, right? Like if I'm a data team, I can now send that to like a bunch of people and rapidly iterate on problems much, much faster. Like super interesting. I think that's a great, great insight for, for our listeners. So here, here's the thread, right? You do all these tables and then I come in and I start asking question. Based on these three tables, could you suggest some guests for us to have on the Marketing Against the Grain podcast? And it says experts in AI machine learning, successful entrepreneurs, marketing strategists, and previous guests with high performing episodes. I think it's actually pretty good advice, right? right? Yeah. But, but, but what's interesting is I said, based on the data analysis, or I said, provide 10 show ideas and titles that you think would rank in the top 25% of episodes for both RSS and YouTube. And here's what it gave us. Mastering AI and marketing, a deep dive with an AI expert. Startup to scale, the growth journey of a successful entrepreneur. So it took a lot of the, the successful titles that we had and kind of repackaged them. It's not like mind blowing, but it's like actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah I think this is where there's still that last 20% is going to be really hard for AI. Like there is a company called Air. I don't know if you saw it, but there's a lot, a lot of traction on Twitter. And Air basically yes. allows you to do kind of sales calls and customer support calls through an AI. So it sounds like a human, but it still is very much like an AI experience. It's like monotone. I don't think it's something you would actually integrate into your go-to-market. And I suspect that last 20% where you go from like, 
best practice content recommendations because it's just extracted all of the data from the web and then it's averaged out like the recommendations to the 20% where someone will actually go, wow, there's something like really amazing that I would not have come up for is going to be really hard. But actually getting that, getting like a general feel of like, what are some categories? What are some areas? What are some commonalities? Like, and get you thinking around like, okay, well, how can I build on what the AI is giving me? That is going to make speed of thought, speed of iterations, speed of execution much, much quicker. Exactly. So right now, if you're thinking about AI, and you're thinking about code interpreter, it is directional, not absolute. The data is going to be absolute. It's going to help you package the data in a way you can better understand it. As you're asking it for recommendations and ideas based on that data, they're going to be directional. They're going to be interesting, but you're going to have to take your brain and apply the last 20% to actually make them awesome. You're going to have to, say, you're not going to be able to just say, oh, I'm just going to go do these shows. It's like, oh, the AI is right. I should do some more shows on these topics. Let me go and repackage and think what five awesome titles might actually be for shows on these topics. And we're the five people in this kind of category of expert I want to go talk to. And that is the big difference between what I think AI will probably get to in the future, where it will do that last 20% and where AI is now. But Code Interpreter is one of the most interesting AI tools out there today. I think we have shown you very tactically how you can build interesting charts, graphs, and practically use them with an AI agent to grow your business, to grow your podcast, to grow your YouTube channel, everything. And it's pretty awesome. I know it's just the beginning. I'm sure as they make updates, we'll be back with lots more tips, lots more strategies on this. But our, we're leaving here a little minds blown. The, sh the shared aspect of chat GPT shared threads, super underrated. Hit us up in the YouTube comments. What is your favorite code interpreter use case? And we will see you really soon on Marketing Against the Great. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better.